Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you guys know about an opportunity to learn some of the most important skills in life, if not the most important skills. And those are the skills of learning and doing so rapidly, effectively, and easily. You see, guys, I'm putting on a completely free 60-minute webinar that you guys can check out where I will be going into my absolute best memory tips, learning tips, and speed reading tips so that you can immediately begin applying them and accelerating your learning of anything and everything. All you need to do to claim your spot in this free webinar is visit jle.vi slash webinar. We have showings at many different times throughout the days for every time zone, but you have to log in and claim your spot. So that's jle.vi slash webinar. And I really look forward to seeing what you guys achieve. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You guys, one of the only things that every nutritional expert that we've had on the show seems to actually agree on is that we all need to eat more vegetables, eat more greens, eat organic, cut out all the processed junk. Well, who has the time, right? Who has the time to go out, do the shopping, make the salads, make the juices, make the smoothies? And that's what I love so much about Organifi. Their product is an all organic green juice. It has all of the nutrients that you need. It tastes absolutely amazing and it's made by wonderful people who I consider to be personal friends. And as listeners of this show, you guys can actually save 20% on your first order and all you have to do is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and use the coupon code SUPERHUMAN at checkout. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to today's episode. You guys, today's episode is brought to you thanks to a wonderful review by, I'm pretty sure they put this name in there just to make me laugh, Hot Chocolate, but the hot and the chocolate are misspelled in a salacious way. In any case, five stars. (laughs) This is great. Listening to Jonathan Levy and other guests on this show gives me an understanding of the reality of leveling up in life. Keep doing it. Thank you very much, Hot Chocolate. Chocolate, hot chocolate. I get it. Thank you very much, hot chocolate. On to today's episode, you guys. Today we are joined by Michael J. Gelb. He's the world's leading authority on the application of genius thinking to personal and organizational development, and he is a pioneer in the field of creative thinking. He's also an executive coach and an innovative leader. He's worked with DuPont, Genentech, Merck, Microsoft, Nike, and the Young President's Organization. He's also published 14 books. That's pretty creative, if you ask me, ranging from How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci all the way to Thinking for a Change. And his books have been translated, by the way, into 25 languages. So about the episode. Well, Michael and I talked a lot about, you guessed it, creativity, but we go much deeper. We talk about how creativity is much more than many people think it is and how it's not what a lot of people often think it is. We talk about how creativity and memory and learning are so intrinsically linked. And we talked about some different ways that you can enhance your mind, your brain, and your life. But I suppose that's every single episode on this show. Nonetheless, it's an amazing episode, and I know you guys are going to love it. So without any further ado, let me introduce you to my new super friend, Mr. Michael J. Gelb. Michael, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? Wonderful. Thanks very much. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited because people ask me about creativity a lot. And in fact, creativity is a a very important part of what I do. It's a thing that holds some of my students back when they're trying to improve their memory. And so I'm really looking forward to learn how we can improve our memories by improving our creativity today. 
Well, creativity and memory definitely go together. The better your memory, the greater the possibility for creativity. And as you develop skills in creative thinking, you strengthen your memory. So exactly. Awesome. So tell me this, Michael, how did you get to where you are today in the sense of what got you interested in creativity? Well, it seemed to me that creativity is the most important skill that any of us could have. All human problems have been solved by someone coming up with a new solution. <laughs> and it seemed that the ability to think creatively, both a personal basis and a societal basis, was distinguishing characteristic for success, for fulfillment, for well-being. Yet amazingly, it's not taught in schools. So I wanted to bridge that gap. And I started by thinking about who are the most creative people who've ever lived and what can we learn from them. And of course, that led me to Leonardo da Vinci. And eventually, I wrote this book called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. But I've also studied the creative strategies of many other great minds. And what's most fascinating is when we discover the similarities between great creative minds from different parts of the world, in different fields, in different times. And when they all tell us the same basic things, then maybe we ought to pay attention. Wow. And so at that point, you decided to devote your career to traveling around the world and speaking and writing on this all important topic, which is creativity. Well, way back in the late 1970s, I actually got invited to speak at a seminar in Switzerland for a group of senior managers from a global computer company. And I was only 26 or 27 years old, but I'd been studying creativity and accelerated learning independent thinking and how to cultivate it, memory. And yeah, they invited me to be part of this seminar and the head of human resources for this company was there and said, we want this young American guy to be on all our seminars around the world. So all of a sudden wow. I was flying all over the world leading five day seminars. This is in the late seventies. The seminar was called the mind and body seminar. We taught meditation, all kinds of you know, stuff way ahead of its uh, time, and people really loved it. And now I travel around the world and I teach seminars for people half my age. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works, huh? Yeah, man. It goes fast, too. That's crazy. So, okay. So one thing that you said really stood out at me because I love thinking about da Vinci and I love this idea of just how multidisciplinary people used to be before we spent all our times, you know, trying to become insects and trying to specialize. <laughs> right. How do we think like da Vinci? What does it mean to think like da Vinci? Well, whatever you want to learn, it helps to have a role model. So we know that uh, baby ducks learn to walk by watching their mother. <laughs> if you go to the mall and you watch families walking, you see the kids having similar gait patterns to mom and dad and similar slouches and slumps and so on. A lot of learning by imitation takes place unconsciously. But the idea that we can do it consciously is a wonderful idea. So let's consciously look at Leonardo, for starters, since he's probably the most creative person who ever lived, mm -hmm. what I did, it was I read his notebooks over and over and over again, and I went around the world to contemplate his works of art. I interviewed leading scholars of da Vinci, and I literally walked in da Vinci's footsteps and aimed to look at the world from his point of view. And... I began to dream about him, and from those dreams and that exploration, these principles emerged for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. And the first one is in Leonardo's native Italian, curiosità, curiosità. Of course, it means curiosity. Leonardo is probably the most curious person who ever lived. And the reason it's the first principle is that it's the beginning of the integration of all the other principles, but it's also our birthright. Every child is born wildly curious. And it's also interesting to notice that besides asking lots of questions and being wildly curious, 
every child is tremendously imaginative. And Leonardo was renowned for his incredible imagination. He offers all sorts of imagination exercises in his notebooks to inspire his students. The other thing we know about children is they have seemingly unlimited energy. So there's an obvious correlation between passionate curiosity, wild imagination, and unlimited energy. The problem is we send children to school where they learn that answers are more important than questions. They're taught to stifle their imagination, and we slowly but surely dull their energy. So I try to help my clients, my readers around the world experience a renaissance of their original birthright of curiosity, imagination, and energy. And there are all kinds of fun ways to do that in the book. We guide people through a whole curriculum for rediscovering that core curiosity. But one of the simplest, most practical, immediately applicable things that everyone can do to begin experiencing a renaissance of that natural curiosity is to do what Leonardo advises that we do, and that is to carry a little notebook with you and write down your ideas whenever you think of them. I really like that. I actually just recently started doing that. And the reason I did it is because I, you know, I used to always say, well, why do I need a notebook? I have my phone on me. And you know what I realized, Michael, is every time, every time I pull out my phone, there's always some kind of notification or some kind of buzz or some kind of thing that will pull me out and is more interesting than writing down my own creative original thoughts. <laughs> and so I've started, you know, in the oddest way, sometimes our productivity tools make us less productive. And less creative and less original and more, I mean, look, it's wonderful. It's a great world of possibility. And if you want to get access to all kinds of information, but it's also designed to hack your brain and your nervous system to take over mm -hmm. and have you not be running your agenda, but their agenda. So we have to really be disciplined. And I love your example is is recognizing the artisanal, old-fashioned power of your own notebook and writing in your own hand and doing what Leonardo suggests, which is to doodle creatively, jot down your thoughts. And remember I said before that it's not just Leonardo. This is the exact advice that Thomas Edison gives to the people who work in his laboratory. Mm -hmm. He tells them to carry a notebook with them, jot down their ideas, you know, it seems that one of the big differences between a genius and an average person, when Leonardo da Vinci or Thomas Edison wakes up at four o'clock in the morning with a crazy, wacky, off-the-wall idea, they write it down in their notebook. Whereas the average person wakes up at four o'clock in the morning with a crazy, off-the-wall idea, and they think, hey, I'm no genius, they go back to sleep. <laughs> Isn't that the real tragedy of it too? And I think there's something more to be said there, which you pointed out, and that is one of the key steps to becoming a better thinker and a more creative person is to stop saying that you're not a creative person, that you're not a high level thinker. I call it the psychological Pygmalion effect or the psychological Golem effect, where if you don't believe that you're a creative person, guess what? You're not going to be a creative person. The, the mind has this incredible capacity to manifest reality. Well, you're exactly correct, and we can focus on that for a moment and just explore in very commonsensical terms why that is true. Because what you say is, I strongly support what you just said, and I've looked into why it is so, and it's actually really simple. I mean, there's also research behind it that shows that if you think of yourself creative, you score 25% uh, higher on a creativity test, and if you think of yourself as not creative, you'll score 25% lower. But it's not just some mystical, magical, law of attraction of creativity thing. What it is, is if you think you're creative, you will look for solutions. Right. And if you don't think you're creative, you won't look for solutions. So it's just like the on switch. If you think I'm creative, therefore I will find solutions. Click. You just turned on your hundred billion brain cells. And you got them all working on the problem. 
If you think I'm not creative, you just clicked it off and those brain cells are not working on the problem. So to find solutions, yes, you need to be solution oriented. And a big part of what I've been doing with people for many decades is just getting them to make that shift to think of themselves as more creative. And as soon as they do, well, I, you know, I actually give them a creativity test in the class and their scores go up at least 25%. A lot of times they go up even more than that because it's just the on switch. Wow. That's really, really cool. You know, I wanted to ask you, and I feel like I stole some thunder from the rest of the interview, but I wanted to ask you, what are some things besides that, I suppose, that we can do to improve our creativity? I mean, in our course, we teach, and I'm sure we can cover this in more detail, but we talk about multiple uses and perspectives, exercises, but I'm interested to hear any and all, including those things that we can do to actually hack our creativity. Sure. Well, let's just stay with the mindset, first of all, because if you get the mindset, then you can really apply the tools of creative thinking. And if you have the mindset and the tools, you can learn and apply the phases of the creative process. And if you have the mindset, the tools and the phases, you can then also cultivate the core sources of creative energy. And if you have the mindset, the tools, the phases and the energy, <laughs> then you can cultivate the relationship building skills to help make your creative idea come true. So I've researched this, written about this and teach it in a comprehensive framework that I sometimes refer to as innovation literacy. Everybody wants to innovate and be creative, but if you don't have the mindset, if you don't have the tools, if you don't know the phases, if you don't know how to cultivate the energy and you don't know how to communicate about it, well, then you're kind of illiterate. <laughs> I like that. Right? So I love the mutual. You've obviously focused on this uh, in a deep way. So you get, and that's why we're, we're just taking our time here. We could spend the whole time just talking about the mindset because – and we need to talk about it first, because if you don't think of yourself creative, you're not as creative, you're not going to learn the tools, phases, energy and communication skills. So first, you have to learn to adapt that. And even if you don't believe that you are, and I work with a lot of people who think they are not creative. I work with a lot of engineers, a lot of scientists, a lot of people with lots of academic analytical qualifications who don't necessarily think of themselves as creative. And when you get them to make that shift, it's life changing. So these are people I've been working with for literally for decades. And my biggest client now came from a client from 20 years ago where I got this group of construction engineers to, to start to think of themselves as creative. And this one woman who was a young woman on that team back then rose up to became executive vice president of another engineering company, brought me in to teach these skills to her company, which I did for four or five years. And then a young woman who was on one of the first programs I did for the second company went off and is now a senior person at another company and brought me in. So that's my biggest client today is basically the, the grandchild of a client from 20 years ago. Wow. And the through line with, these are all engineering, these are construction management companies in the greater New York, New Jersey area. So these are very down to earth, get her done type people. But what they've all discovered is that this shift, this mindset shift has opened up a whole new world for them. So first element is yes, get in there and help people change their idea of what's possible because it does become a self-fulfilling prophecy, not in any mystical way or maybe in a mystical way, but we can't validate that. But just very simply that you're obviously now oriented to look for solutions. And part of what helps them make that shift, and I'm sure you emphasize this as well, is when you get people to recognize that creativity isn't just for artists, right? People have this limiting notion that, 
oh, well, my, you know, my sister was the creative one. She was good at the piano or she was good at theater or she was good at drawing. I'm not creative because I was good at math or I was good at science or construction or you know, mechanical engineering or whatever. But th this is just another a very common limiting idea of what creativity is. Because if you want to be a great mathematician, if you want to be a great engineer, if you want to be a great scientist, creativity is a core competency for greatness in any of those fields. And by the way, if you want to be a great musician or performer, your ability to think analytically and scientifically is going to be critically important to greatness in any of those fields. And this is, again, why do we think of Leonardo as the most creative person who ever lived? Because he was a master of both science and art, and he created this seamless integration between them. That's the fifth principle in how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, arte scienza, balance art and science, logic and imagination. Wow. I resonated with so much of what you said and I identified a younger version of me and what you said because I used to say, you know, well, I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm not a creative person until at some point someone caught me by the ears and looked me in the face and said, <laughs> what the hell do you think you're doing when you come up with new business ideas, new products, new ways to talk about your product? Like, what the hell do you think the entrepreneurship is if not creativity? And I was like, oh, I guess you're right. I, I guess I am creative. You know, and, and it's we have this narrow, just like I think we have a narrow idea of what intelligence means. So we have such a narrow concept of what real creativity means. Very much so. And, and it's great. That, thank you for sharing your epiphany around what it means to be an entrepreneur, because it is all about creativity. That is what entrepreneurship is. And then let's say you succeed and you build a company, then you have to become a leader. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and leadership demands creativity, especially in the world now. I think 40, 50 years ago, things seemed a lot more static. Organizations were built for stability. Technology wasn't changing so rapidly. People envisioned a career with one organization for their entire life until they retired. They had a clear path of going up through management by hitting certain goals and criteria. So it didn't seem that flexibility, agility, liveness, creativity were all that important. But of course, that world doesn't even exist anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and yet people still often think in a top-down, linear, hierarchical, command and control sort of way. So yeah, I've been helping them bridge the gap and learn to think, like Leonardo da Vinci, learn to think in this more free-flowing, open-minded, playful, non-linear way, but then organize that and put it into a linear format so you can communicate it and execute it. You know, this ability to go back and forth between these modes. What we still see are plenty of people who, you know, are called creative types, but they're not really creative. If you're just imaginative and you get lots of ideas, but you never actually get anything done, that's not creative. That's fantasy. <laughs> imaginative <laughs> right but if you're just you know hard nose results all the time focused on step by step prove it prove it prove it uh, you're never going to do anything new so we need to be able to shift out of you know and most people do have a tendency one way or the other so become aware of what your habitual tendency is and then cultivate the skills of the other side of the continuum so you can develop this quality of balance, which again, most perfectly, beautifully, magnificently manifested by Leonardo da Vinci. Right. Michael, I want to ask you, because up until now, we, we've talked about mindset. And I think when people hear mindset, they think about, you know, doing lots of self-work and stuff like that. But I've actually been told in the past that it's shockingly quick to become a more creative person. In fact, I've read that in a matter of a few hours of practicing and exercising and thinking, you can actually measurably become 
a much more creative person. Have you found that to be true in your experience? Well, that's what I get people to pay me to do. So I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, I'd, you know, the truth is, I mean, I give a keynote sometimes. It's you know, forty-five minutes, and people tell me to change their life and change their self-concept, and they got an overview of how to think like Leonardo da Vinci or how to innovate like Thomas Edison or inspiration of Einstein or any of the other great geniuses that I bring to bear in the various seminars that I teach, you know, I, I have a lot of experience seeing how that works. And having said that, I'd rather have people for longer. I'd rather go into more depth and help people change at an even deeper level. If you just get people to stop and, you know, just show them how to take notes in a nonlinear fashion instead of a linear fashion, it does free them from the tendency to prematurely organize their ideas, which is a way that people just lock down their creativity. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can help people experience an opening very quickly. And then you want to consolidate it. You want to build the whole curriculum, you know, to build the whole curriculum. Uh, and then we're talking about leadership. Now you're a successful entrepreneur. Let's say you, you've created a company and you have a, a bunch of people who work for you. How do you help others become creative. That becomes a really important part of leadership. So you can't teach the whole curriculum in a half a day or a day, but you can give people a huge breakthrough. And you know, hopefully people who are, are listening to us are already shifting their, their sense of what's possible. And there's a lot more that you can do in an hour or an hour and a half or a half a day or a day. And you know, that's what, when I always figure when I work with clients and just Okay, who's there? What's your goal? How much time do we have? And then how can we give them as much as possible in that time? But if you want to get the whole curriculum, it's going to take longer than a half a day or a day. Sure. And if you want a truly creative life, then this is something that you're immersed in on a daily basis for the rest of your life. I think that's a really important distinction. And I definitely also identified with that in that, you know, I can help someone dramatically transform their memory in an hour. We can sit together and I can tell you about mnemonics and the memory palace and a lot of these techniques. But if you want lasting results and, and you want to be able to do it without me walking you through it, then yeah, you're looking at, you know, spending a few weeks, a few months, making these techniques a part of your daily life. Do you teach the, uh, the number rhyme system? We teach a couple different systems for numbers. The main one that we advocate is the major method. So converting each letter into a, into a consonant. Love the major method. I, I used to be uh, really into that. And I got up to, I don't know how many thousands of things that I was remembering. <laughs> for me, I do a one to 10 memory quiz for my classes and they, you know, they get four out of 10. And then I, I teach them just the number rhyme system and they get 10 out of 10. And like you say, that whole exercise, the first test, teach them how to make associations using images, basic principles of mnemonics, then retest them. You have the experience of the amazement in the room when they effortlessly suddenly remember some you know, things beyond what they thought they could. And it lets them know that it's possible to train your mind. Wow, I didn't know. Most people don't know that. They just think they're as smart as they are, how good they did at school. That's what they are, and that's it. So that's part of the power of, of memory training is it helps people become aware, oh, my God, my mind is much better than I thought it was. And I can learn a simple system and a few basic principles, apply them, and I get immediate results. The great thing about it for creativity is when people realize that, okay, the mind works by association. And if you want to remember something, you want to get reliable patterns of association. That's what recall is. It's a reliable pattern of association. Whereas creativity begins with new patterns of association. What's the relationship between them? Well, the more you remember, the more data you have access to, the more you have stored, the more 
possibility for new connection or combination. And that possibility grows not arithmetically, but exponentially as you store more. And the connection goes even beyond that in a way that I emphasize for my students when, because I, I just use the memory exercise now as in the framework of the innovation literacy program and introducing the creative mindset and the relationship between imagination and creativity. Because I get them, as I'm sure you do, if you're using the major system, you get them, once they have the number code, they're forming pictures in their mind to make associations, right? Absolutely. Okay, so once you form that picture and you see how effortless it is to then remember whatever it is you wanted to remember, you're not just learning that your mind is better than you thought. You're not just learning that there's a relationship between memory and creativity. What you're also doing is learning to create image associations quickly, which is it's like an aerobic exercise, a perfect training methodology for this fundamental aspect of creative thinking, which is to learn to think in images. Mm -hmm. You know, the picture's worth a proverbial thousand words. And if we can get people to start thinking and expressing their ideas in images, which we do, they experience just a whole other dimension of intuitive insight, of an awakening a renaissance, a reawakening of the imagination power they had when they were children. And this is what Leonardo da Vinci advocates in his notebooks. It's why he draws creative images throughout his notebooks. And it's why Thomas Edison has all these creative doodles throughout his notebooks. Edison's doodles became 1,093 United States patents. And da Vinci's doodles are selling at auction for wildly high prices. <laughs> you saw that one of the da Vinci paintings just sold for $450 million. It's just incredible. And it's not even one of his better paintings. But basically anything he touched is utterly priceless. But the really good news for us is we can take his inspiration. That's what I tried to do in How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci is take his inspiration and give people a systematic, practical way to integrate this into their own lives. I love it. I love it. So I want to ask on that note of systematizing, and I know there's a lot of work that people can do and, and people can reach out and check out your lectures and courses. What's one piece of homework that they can do right now? to improve their creativity? Well, there's an exercise in How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci in the Curiosita chapter called 100 Questions. And the exercise is so powerful. And just I got so many letters from readers over the years that this exercise helped them I, one fellow did the exercise when the book first came out 19 years ago. And he, what you do is you write down 100 questions and you do it without stopping, without thinking, without lifting your pen from the paper. If you want to put on some Baroque music or Gregorian chants in the background, uh, create a nice environment, do it like a meditation. But it's one session, you write 100 questions. People say, what should the questions be? Anything you want. And the first 20 or 30, you're just writing questions and you're sort of in your normal mind. Then you start to get a little tired, maybe even fatigued. And when you get to 40, 50, 60, you're saying, why am I writing all these stupid questions? That's a question. <laughs> right? That's yeah, a question, right? You get to 70, 80, 90, 100, and people shift into another domain of mind. Then you take a break. And you come back and you look at your 100 questions and you highlight the ones that have the most energy or the most power or that just inspire you the most. And then if you really want to go crazy, you can do some stream of consciousness writing on each of the most powerful questions. And this exercise just takes people into a whole other domain of mind, of awareness, of consciousness, of receptivity to a realm of intelligence which is the source of the real creative power. I mean, it's getting out of your own habitual, everyday, 
blah, 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 yada, yada, yada way of thinking (laughs) and into the realm of genius. So this exercise is so powerful. Actually, a couple of years ago, I wrote another book called Creativity on Demand. And I brought the exercise back and I said, look, in case you didn't get this in, in How to Think Like Leonardo, you got to do this. Wow. <laughs> so if you want to do one exercise to shift yourself into a whole other realm of the creative, 100 questions and then choose your top 10 and then do some stream of consciousness writing around those questions. And do this in, obviously in your notebook and just rinse and repeat till you have a stunning breakthrough idea that is your new entrepreneurial venture or the – whatever breakthrough you've been looking for in your life, this is one way to, to make yourself much more receptive to that big aha. I love it. I love it. I realize we're coming up on time here. So I want to ask you if there are any other kinds of superhuman hacks that you have uh, to help you perform at a higher level physically or mentally. Well, the, you know, there's lots and lots of, I mean, learn the elements of the creative mindset, learn the creativity tools the two greatest that I know are a stream of consciousness writing and mind mapping. Learn the phases of the creative process. Learn how to cultivate creative energy and then learn how to communicate in a creative way. So, the, you know, basically, this is what all my work is about. It is the, I'm trying to create the library for the innovation literacy overall. But if I just give one other specific way to catalyze your creative power, it would be to learn to meditate, Mm. to develop some kind of daily practice to completely quiet your mind. Uh, I teach this uh, through Tai Chi, Qigong, but you don't have to do it the way I teach it. Just do something. To just do something, have some kind of practice every day. You are like an antenna. We are all an antenna. There's an amazing broadcast of genius going on all the time, but there's so much static in everybody's antenna today that they're not, they're not downloading the broadcast. <laughs> totally. So Qigong, Tai Chi, meditation, some kind of practice, tune the antenna every day, and then you, can get, you get the message. Fantastic. Fantastic. Michael, I want to give you an opportunity to let people know where they can learn more, uh, where you're speaking, or if people can check out any online courses or anything that you might want to share with them. Thank you so much. Uh, Best place is michaelgelb.com. That's G-E-L-B, michaelgelb.com. We've got all kinds of free articles, videos. We have a free newsletter. It's uh, G-E-L-B, michaelgelb.com. We also have at 1440 Multiversity out in San Jose, California, an intensive Da Vinci retreat coming up in the beginning of the new year, January 1st to the 5th. And then I'll be at Esalen Institute doing a weekend retreat on my new book, The Art of Connection, Seven Relationship Building Skills Every Leader Needs Now. Awesome. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting today. But before I let you go, I want to ask you our last question, which is what would you say is the number one takeaway that you want people not to forget from this episode? Think of yourself as way more creative than you ever had previously imagined. Make that mindset shift and then explore the whole curriculum of innovation literacy. Love it. Love it. Michael Gelb, thank you so much for spending your time with me today and sharing your wisdom. I certainly enjoyed it and I know our audience did too. Thank you. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today. But I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.